brief respite from the old family time this morning? I, I did, yeah. I, uh, I actually, I was supposed <laughs> to be working, but um, I, uh, uh, I did a week's holiday last Sunday, ending last Sunday, but because of the John Delaney stuff, I worked that Sunday, so I managed to get the day off. So I have some family stuff later on, dinner, so... Very good. This and right, okay. also <laughs> alongside as well, Rory Keane, Sunday pay-per-view debutant today. Yeah, yeah. Long time listener, first time. Yeah. First time yeah, caller. Yeah, first time <laughs> caller like, yeah. You're uh, you're going to be heading to the Viva later on this afternoon? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it now. I think if we're saying it out there, it's, she says the makings of a, a classic, I think, you know. She's Sun in the sky, perfect yeah, for Toulouse. Say, yeah, Toulouse, Chesed Colby, James Lowe, Jordan Larber, yeah. Oh, Mark Jasper, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Days, yeah. Um, so we'll go straight into the headlines. Um, as has been the case over the last few weeks, it's the front page of the Sunday Times where we are going first. Uh, they're leading with uh, another scoop on the uh, FAI governance, FAI payment to Delaney's ex-girlfriend. This is a total of €60,000 in professional fees recorded for 2013-2014. This is another scoop by Mark Tai and Paul Rowan as well. So uh, John Delaney issued an instruction, they say, to the FAI's finance department to pay his then-girlfriend €15,000 in 2014. Internal records from the Sunday Times show. Uh, we'll be talking a bit more about that uh, shortly. Uh, neither Delaney, who's been on gardening leave since Monday, nor the FAI, they say, has offered an explanation as to what the payments were for. Uh, the uh, former girlfriend of John Delaney in question, Su Susan Keegan, um, the, uh, she has denied. Uh, she has denied receiving any payment from the FAI or John Delaney. Uh, in the sports section of the Sunday Times, they lead with a picture from yesterday's action at the Rico Arena. Down and out, Munster dream over after 32-16 loss to Saris in Euro semi-final. It's a photo of uh, Alex Lazowski and David Strettel tackling Munster's Mike Haley during yesterday's defeat uh, at the Rico Arena. And also there, a small picture towards the bottom of uh, Billy Vunapola when he was confronted on the pitch by a Munster fan after the game. That Munster fan was uh, detained by the um, stadium security. <coughs> on the back page of the Sunday Independent, they also lead with Munster's defeat, end of the road. Munster blown away by ruthless Saracens. Um, picture of Tyg Byrne looking forlorn yesterday at the Rico Arena after yesterday's defeat. And also the bottom, un United's underperformers handed an ultimatum. That is after uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has apparently started to lay down the law on a few of his underperforming players after the defeat against Barca during the week. Five defeats out of seven games now for them. And they're away to Everton this afternoon. You can hear that on Off the Ball. Uh, on the Irish Mail on Sunday, a Sarri State, uh, second best Munster run ragged as they slip to yet another semi-final defeat. And this time the pictures of Peter O'Mahony at the Rico Arena yesterday. Saracens 32, Munster 16. We'll be uh, talking about the reaction to that game uh, in just a few moments' time. On the Sunday Mirror, they lead with a picture of uh, Phil Foden and his Manchester City teammates celebrating his goal yesterday. Pep, my finest hour if I win, uh, if I win second title with City. Uh, Pep Guardiola says his achievements at Man City will rank among the proudest of his career, even if they fail to defend their championship, uh, their Premier League title. And then, oh man, Solskjaer, no quick fix. It's going to take years to sort out this United team. Uh, a lot of work for United to do in the summer in the transfer market. The Sunday World also go with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Solskjaer says, we'll gift pool title. United boss to eat toffees, then bash City. Uh, most importantly for United, of course, they are playing Man City on Wednesday night and a win there would uh, go a long way to giving Liverpool their first uh, title in, what, 20, 29 years. Um, but a long way to go there. It's hard to see them beating Man City in the form they're in at the moment. And also then on the back page of the Irish Sun, kicking De Bruyne. That is after uh, Kevin De Bruyne went off injured yesterday. Fears season is over for Kevin. Uh, it looked an innocuous enough injury yesterday. He was able to walk off the pitch, but... Uh, Pep Guardiola said he didn't he didn't know too much about his injury. Uh, they're hopeful it's not going to be too long, but with just a few games left really in the season, it could be a season ender even if it isn't that serious. Um, guys, I think the first place we have to start again this week is the front page of the Sunday yeah. Times and uh, Mark Ty's latest uh, latest big scoop on the FAI governance and John Delaney. Yeah, this is um, this is another. Um Incredible story that Mark has unearthed and uh, Paul Rowan has worked on it with him as well. Um, like even the, the headline, like you don't expect to see headlines again, FAI payment to Delaney's ex-girlfriend. Um, and it's, uh, 
It's, it goes back to his previous the relationship be before the one he's in at the moment with a, a woman called Susan Keegan, and that the FAI's accountancy system recorded a total of sixty thousand of professional fee payments in the name of Susan Keegan in late twenty thirteen, early twenty fourteen, and there's been no explanation from either John Delaney or in the FAI as to what these payments were for, and it's interesting that all this stuff has come out because a lot of stuff has been talked about. Uh, uh, or a lot of papers and different media outlets have got wind of different stories over the years, but they haven't, and some of them, this isn't a total surprise that this came out because we kind of, you know, this kind of stuff has been going around, but nobody's been able to back it up, and clearly Mark has very good information now that he's able to back it up and get it across the line. As he but, says, the internal records seen by the Sunday Times, he's seen yeah. these... He's seen these documents. Yeah, but like there's at least there's at least one whistleblower now because you yeah. know to get a credit card bill, you know you need somebody who's within the system yeah. leaking it. But and it, it show you know it does show you that uh, because I, I I do see stuff out there and saying oh this expo shows up how poor football journalists are that Mark Ty and news journalists got all this. But a lot of football journalists knew a lot of stuff that was happening, but weren't able to get it across the line or were being bullied uh, and threatened by the FAI. Because, like I remember, there was one particular, we had a previous editor called Jer Colloran, and uh, one of the things he did was every time we mentioned John Delaney, he, you would have to, John Delaney, comma, who was paid, whatever it was at the time, 400,000 a year, comma, so he always wanted to keep highlighting the salary. This was so it was an issue for a long time. But they, I remember they were always looking for clarifications, and every newspaper would tell you that the FBI and John Delaney. And one particular day, we had three clarifications, one on top of the other, for stories, and a clar clarification doesn't necessarily mean, or you know, you might necessarily have got a story wrong to have to print a clarification, but it's just it's part of the libel laws here that it's. It's so hard to get stuff out there. Like this is one of the great victories for journalism that he's Mark and the Sunday Times have managed to get the stuff out there, and it's, it's been uh, there've been a lot of FEI scandals over the years, but generally there were one big incident. Like it was some big scandal about tickets at the '94 World Cup mm -hmm. or whatever. But this is the drip feed, as was mentioned, the Rockstars Committee during the week. It's day after day, week after week, more stuff comes out. And there's no way back. Like some people are saying, oh, you know, John Delaney, um, you know, he's on garden leave. He could conceivably come back. But his phone and his credit, FEI credit card were taken, were taken off him last week. And a thing like that, I don't see how there's any way back from that story. Like how, how can you explain that? Like, like we came to expect stuff, ex accept stuff that was completely off the wall. Like if you look on, on, uh, online at the photos of the Euro 2016 draw, you're Roy Keane, Martin O'Neill, sitting together, John Delaney beside them, and beside John Delaney, Emma English's girlfriend. Like, what yeah. was her role at, a, at like a big draw like that? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just, <coughs> it was, it did, it did look like somebody who was making his own rules and who thought he was untouchable, which is a very common thing in Ireland over the years. And it's good that uh, it does look like chickens are going home to roost. Yeah, and as, as they point out in the article here, it says that um, in response to questions, uh, John Tracy, the Chief Executive of Sport Ireland, says that this is, clearly part of the terms of reference for the Mazar's investigation. Uh, this total 60,000 professional fees, as they say as well, Susan Keegan, his ex-girlfriend, she denies receiving any payments from Delaney or from the FAI. Uh, the Sunday Times, though, they say that um, they have seen an email sent by Delaney to the FAI's finance department on February 3rd, 2014, under the subject, 15K Susan Keegan. Delaney asked, can you transfer 15K to the account? It's agreed with Michael Cody and Eddie Murray as an overall payment of €50,000. Um, they do say the FAI's internal accounts show a payment of €15,000 recorded in the name of Keegan three days later on February 6th. In total, the FAI noted at least three payments to the name of Keegan, totalling €60,000. Um, what we don't know is, you know, what these payments were for. Mm. There could be a legitimate explanation for, you know, services provided. Uh, it's the fact that the FAI haven't commented on these. It's, you know, it's where the doubt is constantly arising that they, they aren't providing the information. And we would have seen there's a story in the Sunday Times uh, or in the Sunday Independent about Cricket Ireland CEO Warren Deitrim today. Yeah. He would have given his association a loan of €100,000. But as we'll get to in a few minutes on that story, there is a lot of information there. They've, they've given out the information and 
everything as we can see, this all looks fine. Yeah, it looks to be above board. It's, it's reassuring to yeah. see all that information. Yeah. Absolutely, and one of the interesting things about this, like Eddie Murray, who who was who resigned on Monday, was the FBI's honorary treasurer for and has been for was for a number of, quite a long time, and he has no re recollection of approving the payment for Keegan, and he doesn't recall ever hearing her name before, mm -hmm. and he is the treasurer. So surely that says alarm bells ring and like, what on earth is this about? If it's mentioned in the accountancy system, um, the FAI aren't commenting on it and the woman herself says she knows nothing about it. Like, it's really strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's strange. I think, I think it was a good, just going back to a point Kieran there, said there about Mark, I think that's a really good point that, you know, go back to think about oh, the, the football lads, Mr. Beat here. I think sometimes having someone who isn't on the beat mm. Mm. and isn't compromised by, you know, is my access, you know, bros talk about access now, even in rugby, you know, getting access to players and pressers, you know, <coughs> without that kind of fear of it, you could just kind of kind of go after this info and go after, you know, you can go and chase these things. I think it's, you know, he's done really, really well in fairness to him. You know. And you get the feeling there probably are, there's another story in the pipeline <laughs> next week, there's probably another one down the line a week <laughs> later. Yeah. I would think so because... <sighs> A lot of those board members are there a long time, mm -hmm. and it's hard to imagine um, when you hear stuff like this that there isn't more to it. You know that if this is the kind of uh, practice, if these are the kind of practices that went on, it's a leap of faith to think it's just the odd isolated incident over mm -hmm. 14, 15 I think, years. So I think Paul Rowan does a good job in the sports section of the Sunday Times, yeah. mm -hmm. going kind of into detail about just how much there is needed to be done at the FAI with what we know now that uh, all the board are going to be stepping aside yeah. at, the, at the next AGM. That's one thing I find interesting, Neil, in, in, like, there's a huge argument for that, that they all should go en masse, but at the same time it does raise, like, it does raise the issue then, who runs the FAI? Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. You're suddenly bringing in people, a uh, completely new board. I know there's full-time staff there and hopefully they can keep things ticking mm -hmm. over, but it is a massive sport in Ireland. And to lose all the people who've been at the top for a long, long time does represent present huge challenges as well. And there's no guarantee you get the right people coming in. Like, it's, uh, where do those people come from? Are they coming from the FAI Council, who would have been involved in putting the board in place that's been there for such a long time? You don't know. Like, it's do you go for do you go outside? Like, the Genesis report did recommend having in independent members of the board. And it's something Sport Ireland should really have insisted on. And now they're talking about doing it, but it should have been insisted on a long, long time ago. Yeah, and there's just, you know, it's really starting from scratch at the very, very top. Uh, there are, it's not just replacing a CEO now, as we would have thought, what, when did this first break? Six weeks ago or so, yeah. barely a month ago. Uh, there's so much that's going to be changing at the top of the FAI. Like, wh when are we actually going to be seeing the, f the first shoots of this, you know, are, is this even the report itself? How long are we going to be waiting to to see this? I would say a couple of months. Yeah. You know, that like the AGM is down for July, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the, the, that's when you really have to obviously put a new board in place. But uh, like, who knows how this is going to pan out? Mm -hmm. Like, some of this could end up in court. You don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going to happen. Like, because there's just more and more stuff coming out all the time and it's a, it's a huge in a way it's a huge it's it's a, it's a huge opportunity as well as a huge challenge mm -hmm. because you have the chance to remake to, to redesign the future of Irish soccer and if you get the right people in charge like a lot of other sporting bodies here have here it can make can make a massive difference but I'm wary of messiahs I'm wary of people saying no Niall Quinn and come in and transform everything yeah. or Brian cares and, like Brian's uh, expertise I don't think would be board level. Be, I think he should have some role, but like you have to, Niall's track record in business is up and down, so, and he's also, he would be another celebrity administrator, which you might mm -hmm. want after the last one. So, uh, yeah, I don't think you necessarily need football people. Like I mentioned before, the likes of Gary Keegan, who's worked everything from rugby to sailing, mm -hmm. to boxing, to hurling, you know, and um, he was CEO of the Institute of Sport. Like people like that, that are top class operators, and there's a lot of them in Irish sport, I think, should be looked at, and Irish business, who, and who, who crossed over from sport to business. Yeah, yes. and you mentioned the, the notion of like, you know, Niall Quinn would potentially be another celebrity administrator. Everyone knows who Niall Quinn is, yeah. an Irish football legend. It kind of brings us towards there, there are some very good pieces in the Sunday Independent. They've yeah. done a nice, uh, they have got Brendan Fanning, yeah. their rugby writer Dermot Crow from, uh, from Gaelic Games to kind of go through the governance of their associations and 
Brendan Fanning is writing about Philip Brown, for example, the IRFU CEO, being essentially the, the anti-John Delaney. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we know very little about him. A uh, couple of interesting paragraphs. There are as many images of John Delaney, perhaps the most enduring is from Euro 2012, being carried aloft through the streets of Sopot in northern Poland by Irish fans who'd separated from his shoes and socks. Only one image of Philip Brown springs to mind, sitting behind a desk in the IRFU office. Occasionally, being the mad thing that he is, Brown might have his jacket off, but that would have been on instruction to convey the image of a uh, hard-working leader. Brown, who is an unexciting, careful man, a classic product of South Dublin middle-class Protestant stock, essential IRFU, in other words. Mm. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's, Brendan always does the stuff really well. He's, mm. you know, he's been on the beat a long time and, like, I think it's been referenced loads of times. He did a did a brilliant book years ago, and uh, yeah. you know, from there from to there here. To and if, if anyone has read, it's essential read for a rugby fan or, or a sports fan. But um, yeah, it's a really good piece. It's just uh, it's just about like polar opposites. Like if, as I said, Karen, I mean, Philip Brown would, would have had to work very closely together given the relationship it, yeah. between the. The FAI and the IRFU. Yeah, yeah, the over the Aviva, yeah. yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good line there, like having the half assed FAI close close at hand always made for a good comparison. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. good. While soccer good struggled yeah. to clear its share of the stadium debt, rugby presented teacher with a neatly completed sum before the bell went for the end of class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what I like about this as well is balanced in that it shows the IRFU isn't perfect yeah. either. You know, there's got, uh, it's got uh, issues of its own. And I said, this is something a lot of people might be aware of when he when he talks about the voting power extended to past presidents of the union, which mm. is off the wall, wall. Like long after they served a one season in a blazer, they, uh, you know, they continue to vote to the EGM and they're, you know, they're giving their at home and away internationals. And this illustr uh, the the, the power of this lobby. Uh, derailed Finbar Crowley a couple of years ago from his journey to the president's chair. Crowley had been chairman of the management committee, um, but. Uh, and he was looked at as the uh, as a as a rising star coming in, but he was he was derailed from the presidency because of the power of the ex president. So it's uh, and Philip Brown was very exasperated by this. Like that's that's a kind of relic of the uh, of the amateur rugby era mm. that that's still allowed. And, uh, and I'm surprised at that. Like that, that they still have that kind of power. Um, what the pieces do well, I think, is it kind of it doesn't just present the fact that the FAI are a mess. There are problems with, with every governing body, really. Yeah. And Dermot Crow has gone into some of the issues in the, in the, in the GA where there's a lot of secrecy around, around how much people are being paid and about the governance as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, because he meant there's a lot in the Dermot Crow piece. Like, there's a, a fair amount of it is about credit card use in the GA and how you have to, you know, you need to be you need to give very detailed explanations and receipts for anything that uh, goes in an official credit card. Um, but it does mention, you know, Galway had troubles last year with uh, credit credit card use being official. Mm -hmm. So they're not immune to things. But um, the director, Michael Dignan, Dignan in the Mail talks about this as well, but there should be more transparency in the GA over salaries. Like, we don't know what Tom Ryan the, the effectively the, G, the CEO of the GA is paid. The likes of Peter McKenna, who's a commercial director and the stadium manager in Crow Park, we don't know what he's paid. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, we are given a lump sum, but it's never broken down. We, like we don't, and the same with the GPA, we don't know what Paul Flynn has paid in the GPA. And I, I, like they do get a lot of state funding, and I yeah. think they should be a bit more open about it. And like there is somebody, uh, uh, bum bum bum, uh, bum bum. Uh, yeah, there's a uh, somebody. T he's not. He's not. Uh, qu he's not named here. But somebody says, look, look. It's no secret the approximate figure. I've seen the figure of half of John Delaney's salary be mentioned, or even less than half. But that's very vague. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what? Is, why, why not just say it? Um, like uh, Danny Lynch, the former PRO, says um, he said the DJ would probably be getting about a third of what um, John Delaney was getting, which would be about 120,000. Mm. And that's roughly what John Delaney, or sorry, John Tracy gets the CEO of Sport Ireland. So maybe that is the case. Mm -hmm. I would suspect that the CEO of the G GA gets a bit more, the, sorry, Director General of the GA gets a bit more than 120,000. I'd be surprised if, we, if that's the case. But I don't know why they just don't come out and say it. Like, what is the issue? Is, is part of it maybe that the GA has never really been strapped for cash? That's... They, they're not a, they're not under as much pressure to actually tell us it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Rory? Like, do you think they should? 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I suppose as you said, if it's, you know, it's always that white line, but as you said, if there's a lot of state funding, yeah. you know, and a lot of public funding going into it, then, you know, there's no harm and it'd be just, it'd just be just be interesting to see how it tallies up with, you know, the football and the rugby in terms yeah. of, you know. And like, like given the turnover that IRFU, I would think Philip Brown is is on a quite hefty salary. Yeah, but that's not made public. That's not made public. No, no, really have known either. Yeah, that's not made public. Like, so that's it's, I wouldn't say use it as a defence of John Delaney, <laughs> but there were figures out there for what John Delaney got. We never really got figures for IRFU or the G P G A, which are the two other main, the biggest sporting bodies. Like we do get figures for the likes of Sport Ireland because it's tied into civil service pay grades. Mm -hmm. So we get that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it kind of marries up with you know? There's always this outroar when it comes out like what you know, what people in RT are earning or you know this kind of thing. You know, there's outrage. Does it? You think it sort of tallies up with that? Or, possibly, yeah. possibly. Yeah. yeah, but um, there is a public but, interest. People, you know. You know yeah, but I think uh, because the GA and the IRFU are very successful, I think people would probably be accepting of mm -hmm. the yeah. salaries. You know, they say, okay, we're turning a huge profit every year or a decent profit every year. We've built these stadia, etc. This is what the Paris people in charge get. I think people yeah, say, the, yes, fair enough. Probably the biggest noise uh, of Irish soccer fans would have been of League of Ireland fans who'd be, yeah. you know, going to grounds every week that need heaps of improvement done. They're watching teams that, some of which are probably struggling week to week to pay yeah. wages. And I think that's probably what would have jarred them to see the... Yeah, you know, no, yeah I think that's what the outrage over Delaney is, yeah. is, is rooted in because there were a lot of layoffs within the FAI and a lot, of, a lot of wage cuts. There was a great piece in the Killarney Advertiser this week. I think a yeah. guy called Adam Minehan, I don't know if you read it, but he's involved in Kerry soccer. But he was talking about you, you play cup finals in Kerry and soccer and you players have to pay, to pay, in the games, have to pay yeah. into the game. Yeah. Yeah. So this stuff was going on while a guy was getting his rent paid, while he was getting... All sorts of, uh, you know, massive uh, for pay, spending thousands and thousands of credit cards over on nice shirts and Thomas Pink. Cause that's <laughs> a, not a thousand of shirts, I have to clarify that, but thousands yeah. in general. But. Is that the latest story, the, the shirt budget? <laughs> no, that, was last week, that was last week. Sure, it's next Sunday um, from America. It's easy to get lost in this. Yeah. So. As we mentioned at the, at the top of the show as well, when we were talking about John Delaney, there is a story in the Sunday Independent as well of one of the smaller sporting organisations yeah. in mm. Ireland, Cricket Ireland. Yeah. Do you want to take that, Rory? His <laughs> CEO, uh, Warren Deitrim, had to give a loan to his association of €100,000. And as we said, documents seen by the Sunday Independent, the loan was properly documented in a loan agreement at the time. However, however, the board was not informed until recently after details of John Delaney's controversial loan of €100,000 became uh, public. But uh, details of the loan are recorded in Cricket Ireland's financial accounts, which will be presented to members at its annual general meeting at the weekend. A briefing note appeared ahead of a board meeting on April 10th, sets out the details of the loan and paints a stark picture, picture of the, the deterioration in the association's financial situation. And the Sunday Independent, they have been given tons of information here by Cricket Ireland on why the loan was needed, when it was paid, when it was paid back, and there's just so much clarity in it, yeah. and that's why you're probably not raising as many questions. Yeah, it's that classic thing, it just goes back to even that bloody shambles in the Oireachtas, you know, like anything, if you could, if, as you said, just, you can get out and you can control the message. Mm -hmm. If you inform people like, like this here, you know, it's very detailed. And it's that classic thing of the minute in the media, if you leave a vacuum, as they did last week, you know, you know, people are gonna go and fill it and they're gonna go and they're gonna find it other ways, you know. But yeah, they've come out here, they've been transparent about it. It, uh, it just it pays a comparison to what, you know, what's been going on with the FAI over the last five or six weeks. Like. Yeah, and the, a lot of the detail in it, it actually kind of paints a stark picture of how financially strapped some of the yeah. smaller sporting organizations in the country are. Cause, like just a couple of lines here. Around that time, Dietram also asked the senior management team to defer their salaries for a week yeah. to help alleviate the crisis, which he says they were all very happy to do. Mm. Um, he offered a €100,000 loan, having exhausted all other potential sources of funding, including the ICC, Sport Ireland and Bank of Ireland. Uh, furthermore, Cricket Ireland did not breach any of its grant conditions with Sport Ireland, having notified them of their difficulties. Yeah. 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 Because one of the things around the FAI thing, uh, people have questioned why Sport Ireland haven't done more. You know, because like John Tracy and Kieran Mulvey would be there as long as uh, uh, John Delaney has been in the FAI. And, but I think part, uh, a large part of that is that I think Sport Ireland invests a huge amount of its energies on the sporting bodies outside the big three of the FAI. 
GA, FEI, GA and IRFU because they're seen as very, as big and, um, you know, they're big international bodies and that the other sporting bodies need more help. And a lot of them are always, there's none of them that are massively profitable. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all very close to the line every year. And it's, it's interesting when you look back to, there's reference here, when Jutram took over at the end of 2006, Cricket Ireland was 260,000 euro in the black. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, the last couple of accounts, a deficit of eight, uh, nearly 85,000 2016, nearly 60,000 2017, and it's going to report another deficit of 2018. And that's as a byproduct of cricket in the last, uh, th those 13 years since Warren has come in, has been very successful. Mm -hmm. You know, was, uh, but that's come at a cost. Like, the tri series with New Zealand and Bangladesh and Malahide and Clontarf two years ago, it cost over 700 grand a stage, but it took, uh, it returned only 342,575 in revenue. And cricket doesn't have the infrastructure to be a huge international sport, so that often needs temporaries. That, so, like temporary grandstands that have been built, marquees erected, a media centre installed, a broadcasting centre installed. Uh, for the England game in September 2013, they did a, basically a 10,000 capacity pop-up stadium. So it's, in a way, it's probably come again ahead of schedule that uh, suddenly cricket took off to a fair extent mm -hmm. and was competing with, Ireland were competing with big teams, but they didn't have the financial backing to deal with that. And, you know, you have to give him credit for giving them a dig. Like Warren Jutram wouldn't have been on John Delaney. No. Uh, type salary, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So to, for him to do that, you know, was was quite qu quite a quite a, a gesture. And just even like the yeah. small things that the you know the contingencies, uh, we have to take responsibility for the position we're in. We can't take all the praise and then blame others for what we're doing. Um, they're talking about Ireland's first uh, first Test match here, and they're saying just the impact the rain has. But in the, uh, I'm thinking. Uh, about rain on day one of the test match of 100,000 euro that should have been revenue we were only able to get 25% because that's all the insur mar insurance market was prepared to give us uh, the full refund to 5,100 spectators for day one hit us hard yeah, yeah. yeah. like Small that is isn't it? Yeah. yeah I mean you know, 5,000 paying customers that you have to refund straight away yeah, yeah. no it's uh it's, yeah. it's a challenge, it's a struggle. I actually think the Sunday Indo is very good today. You know, mm. it's, it's their best week in a long time. It's the best of all the papers this weekend. Um, but like, and it's also, it's got a mixture of news and comment. Like, that's a really good news story yeah. with detail in it. And the GA uh, piece with Dermot Crow, there's a lot of detail in that. And then we'll come to the Paul Kimmage thing in a while. I think yeah. there's yeah. a good read in there. But this is very interesting just in a broader sense in that it shows the challenges for for uh, for so many sports that are outside the top tier. Mm. Like you go through all the papers today, virtually all the papers have uh, soccer. Ninety nine percent of the coverage is soccer, GA, rugby, golf, and horse racing. Yeah, and horse racing basically because Irish Grand Nationals tomorrow. If that wasn't on, it mightn't have any Grand National yeah. racing other than the results. So, um, but there's seventy three national governing bodies under the auspices of Sport Ireland. So the rest are living off scraps, and yeah. that affects everything from sponsorship to state funding, etc. So it's always a struggle for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, will we move on? Um, yeah. I think next on our agenda, we'll talk about the uh, reaction to Munster's defeat yesterday. Oh yeah. Um, a couple of pieces. One of them, Neil Francis, you spoke about this morning here in me. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I was because he mentioned in passing, and it hadn't really occurred to me that. Genuinely, I think the best atmosphere they ever experienced at Crow Park was the Leinster Munster um, Heineken Cup semi final. I'd forgotten it was 10 years ago, but uh, it was just like the noise level was unreal. Like maybe uh, when, when Kevin McManaman scored the goal for Dublin in the 2011 All Ireland final, the stands actually shook. Yeah. Like it was so loud, like that as a moment. But as a whole game, that, that it was hopping. I know. You know, you had the Ireland-England game as well. Were you at that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, that was a great atmosphere. But Le I thought Leinster Munster was ahead of it that day. Oh. But they haven't really recovered. I yep. hadn't really thought about it. Munster have never really kicked back from that. Like, how many semi-finals have they lost now since then? Seven. Yes, yes it was seven in a row. Seven in a row, yeah. you know. And basically, Neil makes the point that... Um, he brings in the comparison with the Premier League and soccer that you have the top six, United City, Liverpool, Arsenal, Chelsea and Tottenham. 
and nobody outside that group will win anything other than an FA or League Cup. Yeah. And he said Munster are now the equivalent of an Everton or Leicester. Yeah. You know, Pro 14, they might win the odd time, but they're just not contenders in Europe anymore. They're, semi, they're perennials losing semi-finalists. Yeah, I think the last... So how do you beat that, uh, break that glass ceiling now? For the last Munster? kind of season and nearly two seasons of Europe has probably shown us where the, where the hierarchy is. You kind of have Leinster, Saracens and Racing 92. Yeah. After that... Monster, probably Toulouse this year. You'd probably put in there. They're they're just they're at the top of the best of the rest category, yeah, yeah. but there is a bit of a gap to get up to the best. And how do you bridge that? Is it finances or what? Do you need <laughs> a lot more money or what? This is the t you see, yeah. Uh, this is the thing, and it's 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 only going to get it's only going to get harder next season because we've got this whole private equity firm CBC who are going to be pouring millions into the Premiership. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're going and we're we're getting to we're in a World Cup year, so. You think, you know, Stephanie, we get to October, all these lads, all these All Blacks, Wallabies, South Africans, they're going to be heading up, they're going to be heading yeah, up to Europe. They take to, their hiatus yeah, for a yeah, couple of years. That's it, come to, up to pension, and you yeah. think, like, they're the guys who can afford to, to get them are, you know, the Leicesters and the Saracens and, you know, this kind of thing. And, like, the, it's funny you go back to the co, co Park and go back to the glory days of Munster. Like, I remember Munster, you know, remember the days when Munster were signing, you know, Doug Howlett and mm -hmm. Rua Tapoki. You know, those guys who just just can't get these guys anymore, you know? You have to, that's why. So, I don't know, there's going to be, it's, it, it's getting to that, we're getting to that time every year now where it's just a reality check and Munster gets to the stage and it's just, you know, they're just not good enough and whether that's... Yeah, and, you, you and know, yesterday and was a, re a real reality check. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't there, no, myself, but I was just talking to a few of the guys who were there yesterday and it was a weird one, I don't know, people felt, but even about 10 minutes into it, it just felt there was a sense of inevitability about it. I just kind of felt they were... It was just sort of almost a containment, and you felt eventually it was just the you know the black waves were going to come, and they were just going to get overpowered. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, Neil, Neil has some good lines there. I think the the best one going back to Crow Park is when he says, um, "Yeah, we did not know after the semi-final loss to Leinster in 2009 how long it would it take to build the cathedral. Notre Dame will be completed in five years' time, by which time Munster will be no closer to their great sides of 06 and 08." Like it's it's a fair point, like you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's 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 a hard one, and um, you know, you know, I don't know what the direction is. Is it a case of you know, is it more recruitment promoting from within? There's a good there's a good branch of probably the best branch of youngsters they have coming through in a long time. There's about five or six of them in the under twenties, and is it a case of fast tracking these guys in or? But uh, yeah, everything's up to debate. Everything's up for debate now with Munster. Yeah, you because know? like three semi finals in a row, and these probably have been the the three years where. The key players, the likes of Conor Murray, mm. uh, Peter O'Mahony, Simon Zebo, you know, for the two previous seasons, Keith Earls. These are the peak years for those guys. They're yes, at the, yeah. the late 20s, hitting 30. Within a couple of years' time, you know, yeah. they'll, you'd imagine anyway, age would dictate that they'd probably be on the wane. Yeah. And then you have this group of young <coughs> players who might be coming through at the moment, but they might be a few years off hitting their peak That's as well. It, yeah. Mm. So it's, it's a tough cycle to break. Yeah, and it's or, uh, yeah, I think I think it's one of those things. It's like it's in an esport. I think Munster were just blessed back in that era. They just, you know, it was one of those anomalies where they just had five or six of these just icons, and they're all in the same team. You take a Folio, Garo, Connell, even guys like Leamy and David Wallace mm -hmm. and Quinlan, and it was just they were they are the nucleus of a team. Mm -hmm. And then they had a guy like Declan Kidney who just, he understood how to, to harness that and it was all just... They were probably a group yeah. that had to learn how to grow up fairly quickly, I'd say, yeah. as well. That kind of early 2000s... Yeah, they had a very problem. strong identity as well. Yeah. Does that, is that identity there now? Is it a strong... You know, it's, I know people say, oh, we, you know, like the outside players who come in and say, oh, how they feel monster and they've bought into it. But I wonder, is mm. it as strong as those guys, really? I don't uh, know. So I kind of question every, every now and again, yeah. but I kind of still end up going back to, I think it probably is yeah. still quite... It might be as strong as it was 10, 12 years ago, but it's certainly very strong. Like, yeah. for example, look at like, look at yesterday. Okay, there was only 16 or so thousand of people at, uh, at the semi-final, which is a pretty yeah. depressing attendance, but... Eight to ten thousand of that was was monster fans. Yeah, but I don't mm. mean with supporters. I mean with players. Like, are the to the squad? Like, so many of those guys were just, uh, you know, they bled monster red. Yeah. Like, you know, everybody yeah. bleeds yeah, red. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but they were monster. They monster red. <laughs> very specific. But they, were, red. but they were like they were part Sorry, of the tradition. Yeah. Like, then they really bought into it. Like, I just. 
Um, I, I'm not sure now if that's the case. I don't know. Like uh, I'm, yeah. I'm speculating. I don't know what you think. Um, but yeah, I wrote about it actually on the point that I just it's not a it's not a you know guys like Chris Farrell and Klein and Byrne they've they've bought into it and they've brought a huge amount of monster. But I just wonder that kind of what kind of made them that great side back in the noughties was there was that bit of a chip on the shoulder and mm. you know no, we're just a bunch of lads, but you're locals from Cork and Limerick and Claire Tip and. You know, ever and um, I just wonder when you, it's uh, gradually is that just been eroded slightly? You know, it just when it comes to these big days when, like, what, what made Monster able to compete with those big giants back then was just that getting to that emotional play. And I just wonder yeah. when it's it goes back to the GA mentality of you know we're from the town or from the parish. Kind of Paul O'Connell used to call it going to the well. It was just something yeah. was it something tangible or palpable? And when you have a team of you know, I think out of the 23 yesterday, only 11 were, were local lads. I don't know, I just wonder, is, it, is there something there in it? Yeah, something because they might like in the nearest sports science, some people, mm. you know, a lot of people do scoff at the a notion of emotion, but yeah, it's I, I always thought though, it yeah. was important for Limerick, or sorry, for, for Munster. Mm. That, that, uh, it gave, the emotion always gives Munster a little bit of an edge, you know, and I think, you know, that's, that can be rooted in where you're from. You know, and if you're not from the place, even though you love the jersey and you buy into it and you love the club, it's still a gig. Mm, like you're right. there because they signed you. And it yeah. could have been Saracens that <laughs> signed you. It could have been somebody else. You know? Yeah, it's it's a weird thing actually, even because Saracens don't have any of that. They don't have any like kind of the history. They're, they don't have much. As you saw yesterday, they don't have much of a fan base. Like Donegal as, Callan, yeah, as, yeah. As, as you mentioned, yeah, yeah. you mentioned Donegal Callan's column from was it yesterday? Or Saturday morning, week? yeah, that's yeah, excellent. Like, and he said, he, he said it's you know, there's stories about big French teams like Claremont going up the bus and suddenly they start pulling into the club and they're like, it's just for Saracens, it's like an industrial estate, like, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. But O'Callan likened it to a, it was very funny, likened it to a you know, visit to IKEA on a Sunday morning, <laughs> like, but then two hours later, you get on the bus and you're like, what the hell was that, like, yeah, and there, you, you've got to give a lot of credit to Mark McCall because he's just created something there that. He's almost manufactured it, a kind of a sense of identity from, you know, but effectively it's a representative side, you know. Yeah, and it's someone I was speaking to, uh, our colleague Gavin O'Reilly about as well today. Are, are Saracens and, by extension, Mark McCall, do they get the credit they actually deserve in Ireland? Okay, everyone gives them their, their due credit over in, over in England. Everyone knows how good they are. I've always found over here there's... There's always been a little bit of turning up the nose at them because they're, they come from, you know, there's money there. Yeah. Because... There's this idea that they kind of bought their way into success. They might have done that initially, but no, they're yeah. producing young players at a, at a rate of knots, mm. and they're just consistently improving and consistently getting better. And you know, an Irish coach over there in Mark McCall, and I don't know. It, for me, anyway, it's felt like they probably don't get that much credit on this island. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And even um, just even McCall, it's where you know, which like we lionise what yeah. Paul O'Connell's doing abroad, what Ronan yeah, O'Gara yeah. is doing. Yeah, you've heard Jackman was over in France. We were applauding the work he was doing. It just seems we're not really doing that for, for for Mark McCall. Is it just Saracens are a bit unfashionable to like? Yeah, that's it's it's, it's, it's I can't get my head around it because I just think. Uh, I, He's a guy who he's he came in there in 2011. He's been a mainstay and he's just created something clearly very special. Clearly, he's able to motivate people. He's able to put a good team around him. But as he said, yeah, we kind of we're very quick to sort of laud the people abroad. Mm -hmm. Like, but he actually I rarely see him included in the conversations about you know even their stuff. Just talk about Andy Farrell, his new attack coach. You mm -hmm. know, like McCall would jump out of me as a guy to. To, to jump into the mix there, but yeah, yeah it's maybe it's just a and there's also a perception of them that they're that they're a bit one-dimensional and they're quite a negative side. But you saw them yesterday; they they play a good brand of rugby. I mean, they're not they're not sort of a freewheeling to lose, but you know they're they're easy and they're easy on the eye as well. And yeah, you know, like sure yeah. up until yesterday they yeah. were averaging what 30, 34 points and four tries a game. Yeah, it's decent it. going. Yeah, yeah, it's not bad, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, but I can see the thing they're they're hard to like and there are there are things coming out there are, there are. Sort of speaking of power to like, that moves us on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Man of the match so yesterday. So, uh, yeah, man yeah. of the match. And our, our great old friend Stephen Jones uh, does it never fails to disappoint. But <laughs> the headline yeah. for a start, anyway. I'll just yeah. um, I'll just it's hold it up here. Uh, tone is yeah. If you want to zoom in on yeah. that, Vuna Pola enjoys last laugh over boo boys. Um, and the paragraph in question, it was after Billy, Vun Billy Vunapoli yesterday scored a try and was given man of the match by BT uh, in the win yesterday. All of this after the week he's had where he had 
come under a lot of criticism for his comments, which <coughs> I suppose supported Israel Folau's stance on homosexuals. And uh, Vunapola himself said that uh, men were, was it men, God created men for women to procreate mm -hmm. along those lines. Yeah. Saracens and the ORFU said that they were, they have warned him essentially over his comments. Funapoli, he hasn't really apologised for any of it though. No, and he kind of doubled down in an yeah. interview yeah. after yeah. yesterday. So yeah. he was booed yesterday by the Munster fans. There was one Munster fan that came onto the pitch afterwards and confronted him. In um, hush puppies. <laughs> no socks. Jeez, Plus, this paragraph from Stephen Jones I think jumped out for all three. <coughs> the occasion was diminished, diminished by the constant abuse by Munster fans of Billy Vunapola. He had a, a tangential part in the Israel Fellow affair last week. Interesting. But, but gradually his reaction has been better understood. By Stephen Jones, but nobody else. <laughs> so whether the shocking abuse of a great player was just a reaction to Vunapola being way too good for them, or whether it was a stand by Munster people against homophobia, something of which Vunapola has never been guilty, then it was distasteful. So too shouts and general noise when Owen Farrell was preparing for kicks at goal. So too the idiot who ran onto the field after Vunapola did a tea interview, TV interview, waving his hands in the face of the big man. The fool was later detained. Now granted that your man who ran onto the pitch yesterday was a fool and mm. all it's kind of done is probably created an image of Vunapola being some sort of victim a little bit mm. more. But... It, that just, I just thought that that was a bizarre, No, it's off the wall. It's, it's completely tone deaf by Stephen Jones. Like, he, he should have more cop on than to come out with this kind of crap. And he, he's not alone in this. Like, BT, That's you know... Yeah, I, 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 I'll yeah. be honest now, I only, yeah. I only saw the interview that BT did with Funapola after the game. I didn't hear the commentary during the match. Yeah, yeah like, when I he was, got there... Yeah, when he got in a dark radio studio for the day, so it's okay, rely on just pictures. But, like, a lot of people weren't happy with yeah, that. Yeah, like, when he got the try, it was something along, like, after the week he's had, you know, a kind of redemption story. And I think in sport, we're often guilty of this, that we want redemption stories, yeah. but... He created the problem for yep. himself. Yeah. And he created, he, he contributed to, to, he made a messy situation even more, even messier. Yeah. And I have no sympathy for him. And why say, no, this is a great redemption story? He's, he arguably should have been dropped for the bloody game because he was completely out of order. And like, giving them that award when they didn't have to was off the wall. It was Austin Healy. Yeah. Who's. An, who's like is is that is that a case of is that a case of if we give him the man of the match, will we know we're going to be able to interview? Him? Yeah, well, yeah, could po yeah. could possibly be because he he he. Uh, you could make an argument he was man of the match, but you could have made an argument for four or five other players. And given what's going on, I think it was a really bad choice. It's a, a terrible signal. But they did they just want this to be part of their redemption story that he get, was getting man of the match and they could interview him afterwards. It's not like he was challenged about what he said afterwards or what he tweeted. So. The the closest thing that resembled an apology was it was never my intention to insult or to, to hurt people. Yeah. But even if it wasn't your intention to do it, yeah, yeah, that's no, it's, that's it's, nowhere it's, near. It still did it. Yeah. 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 yeah, even if if I don't intend to do something and I do something, I'd probably apologise for, you know, for doing it. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, you, I'd be interested to hear your opinions on this. I just find the whole, I just don't know why there's this drive to, you know, to, to why, why he felt the need to, as someone said, place himself in the storm. Like. Mm -hmm. And like, through social media, it's kind of, you know, if you want to go to a forum, if you want to go debate it publicly and have your views challenged, I'm all for that. But just to kind of, weigh in on it and as a lot of ex players have said this week, you know, it was if you read the post it's very it's cumbersome, it's quite it's quite you know, it's messy the way he writes it. He's, he does really his argument doesn't really come across and then just as he said, double down at it and even just from a professional point of view, you know, the biggest week of your team's season and you go in and you do that, like, you mm -hmm. know. But uh, yeah, I'm the same as you know, I I I, I found the tone of BT Sport throughout it a bit strange and a bit kind of, you know, obviously he's a huge personality over there and they know it's such, their bread is buttered, they're deeply embedded, obviously they have the rights to the Gallagher Premiership, but I, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought it all strange. Like, there's, there's rumours as well, there's apparently there's a clip, there's a clip of one stage with the commentary and it's now been taken off Twitter, like, because it's a bit of, you know, oh yeah, the hardest week of his career and he's come yeah. through and all that, and yeah, I just found it all a bit bizarre really yeah. Yeah. but if, you, if you're a gay sure. rugby player gay professional yeah. rugby player like you would really think twice about coming out with when all this stuff is well going also on like on the other so. side you have Nick Heath who is yeah. Yeah. a BT sport rugby commentator yeah. who posted a brilliantly powerful message on yeah. Twitter last week and has spoken about it I'd say he probably felt a bit strange seeing his uh, some of his colleagues yeah. you know 
borderline lionising Billy Vunapoli yesterday yeah. for, you know, redeeming himself, silencing his critics. Yeah. I, saw, I saw someone writing that actually last night, silence the critics. I don't think any of his critics were yeah. you know, criticising his ability to score a try in a semi-final. Yeah, no. People, people no. aren't questioning. You know, no, everyone knows he's a absolutely brilliant and bright and things, but it's just, um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it, it was hard. You know, as you said about redemption, it's more about, you know, actual setbacks in your life, not actually creating a whole storm for your own doing, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Get, yeah. Um, Strange one. We'll move on yeah. from Munster yeah. to Leinster today. Uh, Rory, you're going to be going to yeah. Aviva later on. Um, Devon Toner was across most of the Sunday papers yeah. today, but you you went uh, you went a different way. Yeah, my good friend. Sort of a Johnny. profile on Johnny Sexton. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's 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 been a really. He, he spoke yesterday actually at the Viva, and it was it was a really I don't know if you saw it, a really interesting quote where he said uh, you know when he when he went to Monte Carlo for the the World Player of the Year, did the big bash after after the November Internationals. That's when he's at his peak after we've beaten the All Blacks, and. Uh, he was kind of asked, you know, what was your mindset? And he said, um, you know, I said to my wife, Laura, he said, um, you know, if I win, brilliant. You know, if I lose, fine. If I win, you know, this is going to be another thing to beat me with, you mm -hmm. know? And it's kind of been the way. It's, it's a funny, it's been a very, it's been a funny old six months from because, mm -hmm. la like, last year, him, like, Ireland had the greatest year of all time. Like, mm -hmm. and he was, you know, he was right, he was the, he was right and right and he was at the centre of all Front of it. Front and centre of it, yeah. And it's kind of a bit like Ireland. It's sort of unravelled a bit over the last five or six months. Like as we were saying out there, it's one of the quirks of the central contracts. He played pretty much. He was pretty much every present for Ireland in the Six Nations, and he hasn't played for Leinster since late December. It's yeah, kind of a bizarre game thing. Against yeah, against Munster. Yeah. Uh, bizarrely, it was the last game he actually played for Leinster. Yeah. Which I didn't. I hadn't really thought about it. Uh, until you came in and we were talking about it this morning. Um, it has been a very difficult few weeks for him, uh, or not few weeks, few months from him, as you mentioned, ever since uh, being named World Player of the Year. But like, what is, have you been able to put your finger on what the issue is? Uh, it's, it's, has he been able to, do you wonder? It's one of those things, I suppose it's like form, it's, 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 it's kind of, they're all kind of linked together, but it's, it's a weird one. The, the, the thing that always jumped out of me, I know people like to make big deals, we, we, we love drama and we love, we love like flashpoints. We sport, love redemption you know? stories. Yeah, 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 we do. Yeah, talking about. But uh, <laughs> I always go back to the. He's always been a very fiery character. But I always go back to, as you said, that game at Tobin when Finney and Witcherly, you know, the young buck from Munster, yeah. came out and flattened him, and you know that the moment of t the whips off and whips it at him, and it was just it was. Uh, he just seems a bit more frustrated than usual, but uh, as I said there, I would, would have put it past him to go out today and just absolutely kill it. Yeah. He's would got you, that kind of mentality, you know. Absolutely. But, yeah. but you wouldn't know, unless you're in somebody's shoes, you don't know the pressure they're feeling. And after being made World Player of the Year, going into World Cup year, when Ireland have been talked of as potential winners, like the pressure on his shoulders is immense, like on a number 10 anyway it would be immense, but given he got that award and the World Cup coming up, like you don't know psychologically, has it been difficult for him? You know, no matter how str mentally strong he is. Is there, is there a fear, I wonder, like this could be completely off the wall now and you can tell me if it, like, I wonder is there a fear in maybe a few of the players' heads of, of actually being afraid of peaking too early? Mm -hmm. Of that, they were going into the Six Nations thinking, what happens if, we're, what happens if we absolutely blow the lights out here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, is everyone going to know everything about us? And yeah. I'm not going to say that they deliberately held anything back, but you know, subconsciously, are you afraid of? Are you afraid of going a little step further? Yeah, well, they were definitely, they were they were definitely cranky during the Six yeah. Nations. Mm. They weren't themselves. Like you could see that. I know it was highlighted on TV and stuff with the body language some at different times, and they were snapping at each other, and it just didn't seem as united as it was a few months earlier. And that can be a sign of the pressure. Yeah, you know because. Uh, uh, you do, uh, there's no there's no experience of that kind of pressure with Ireland. You know, yeah, like yeah. 07, yeah, that, that was yeah. hyped up a bit, but not to the same extent. Mm. You know, I think now people genuinely did, and there may, some still do, think Ireland could give the World Cup a real rattle. But um, those guys, you know, they're, 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 they know Ireland have never won a quarterfinal. Like, they so, know they've, and a likely quarterfinal would be against South Africa, who who tend to get right in World Cup years. So and they look like they're getting right as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I, always, I always say to people, people who come to me and say, you know, what do you read into the Six Nations? I always say it's a bit like, you know, a two-season show on Netflix or something, you know, like if you're a bit unsure at the end, 
give it the second, you know, wait till the second part <laughs> and you know, you know, wait for feel. I, I just have, I have a feeling that um, Joe, Joe, and even guys like Johnny and stuff, you know, I think they've that they've thrown everything at the World Cup. And as you said about peaking, you go back to 2015. They went to that last. They went to their World Cup as back to back. Six Nations champs, and we all know what happened. Like you know, so I just yeah. think it kind of works both ways. That's that's what I'd be telling myself, trying to be optimistic about things. You know, I've been to enough World Cups and got stung. You know, but um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, In terms of yeah. Toulouse as well, yeah. you were writing about uh, Leinster Prime to spike Toulouse's tri- thrilling revival. It has been a brilliant revival. That's great because like. I think, as we said outside, for rugby fans of of my age at least, it just feels right to to see Toulouse being back up there. Uh, Playing in the playing in the big games, playing in the big semi-finals, and playing that style of rugby that they are, where they have these big brute forwards so, yeah. like the likes of Rory Arnold and Richie Gray and these guys, but the stuff they're doing out in the back line with Cheslin Colby, it's just it's just amazing to watch. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we we asked um, remember we asked Luke McGrath last week about you know have you ever played ten, and he said he, I think he said something like played like 20 minutes when I was back in Michaels or something like and it's just to lose his score yeah off you go you go Anton yeah. play 10 you know it's, that's and uh, it's great because obviously as I said when we were younger like to lose were just brilliant like, yeah. they were just they were just a great team it's a bit like the OIX the week it's like an old giant coming mm, yeah. back yeah. and it's, it's kind of a thing that even when Leinster lost in October in that game you know the reaction from everyone was like oh it's just great to see them back like. mm-hmm. and um, I think they're to stay and it's, I think they've kind of gone back they were in the wilderness for a few years and Ugo Mole and Fabian Toulouse now, Jim Brahim, he's the director of rugby, and they just kind of stripped it all back. And, and, Reg- said, and Reggie Son as well. Yeah, Straight the Vanden Man. Yeah, that's what I learned. <laughs> like, West Cork is just, you know, <laughs> the tales of redemption, like a lot of things happened down there, but uh, it's just brilliant. And I'm looking forward to saying, you know, I think maybe, as we said outside, I think Leinster, just their pedigree and their experience, I think they'll have enough today, but I think we're going to see. Unfortunately, for the likes of Munster, we're going to see Toulouse at this stage of the competition mm-hmm. for the next five or six years, definitely. The nucleus of that team, very young team. and But uh, ah, it's just great. It's great. Um, speaking Feel of good throwbacks to the late 90s and early 2000s, <coughs> Tiger Woods, plenty of coverage of his mm-hmm. Masters win last week across the papers. There are a couple of bits we picked out as well. Kieran, which is the first one you want to go with? Yeah, well, there's a couple of the, the two positive, like Dermot Elise, who he went. Uh, Dermot went to the Augusta for basically lap of honour as last Masters. So yeah. he writes a fine piece. He always writes well about just um, hooking it on Tiger's uh, mental strength and you know put it in put it in, putting it in context uh, in golf history. And um, Oliver Holt is a very good piece in in the Mail. But the piece that jumped out at me was Paul Kimmage's because. I can see where he's coming from this because yeah. you, you, you know the old WB Yates line. How can we know the dancer from the dance? It, it's how do you dis, uh, how do you um, separate the separate yeah yeah Tiger Woods, a brilliant golfer, from what we know of him as a person, and he tells a few stories about him that I think are quite telling about um, you know his reluctance to tip uh, staff yeah. and uh, um, yeah, there's, it's from. Um, his first professional win yeah. in Las Vegas where Butch Harmon had to tip the, the locker room staff. Yeah. Uh, $300, which by all accounts isn't, isn't enough. Yeah, um, yeah. And Tiger then was just oblivious to the fact that he should have been tipping them in the first place. Yeah, and then there's another story because remember he, he, Tiger, there were reports he was obsessed with Navy SEALs and yeah. he trained with them and uh, Wright Thompson wrote about this and five or six of them went for dinner and uh, the waitress came the bill and everybody went silent and he made no, mo- no move to pay. So eventually somebody said, oh, give us five, six separate bills. But I think the most interesting story was that um, after his father, uh, Earl Woods, died, yeah. that they, um, uh, they presumed that the local uh, Manhattan monuments who make gravestones, a local outfit near the, the graveyard uh, in Kansas where, he, where, he, where he's buried, expected to get an order from Tiger Woods and the family for a gravestone and maybe a particularly ornate one. But they got no call. And 10 years passed and there's no grave marker. It's an unmarked grave, yeah, which is really, really strange. Like, he's a, he's a nod fish. Yeah. You know, and it ends up, Paul Kimmage says he, he asked one of the, happened to course one of the best big golf writers in the US afterwards, said, what do you think? He says, I feel nothing. Like there is that yeah. even watching him being interviewed after like he did show emotion when yeah. he won it but afterwards he was just there's something really cold and detached about him like I find it really hard to to warm to him I have to be honest how yeah. did did you did you watch it live last 
last no, night. No, I was I was on the way back from a, a wedding in Donegal. No, I just so I, I just uh, I, I I watched a bit of the bit of it later on, like I've ever been recorded. So yeah. just to see. Like I, last I, 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 I was here last Sunday watching it, and um, you know we were watching it like it's it was absolutely gripping entertainment yeah. and stuff, and. And when, when he sank the winning pot, I went, oh, you know, <coughs> God, what a story and all that. I can absolutely see where Paul Cambridge is coming from in it, though, because yeah. there are so many stories about him that just leave you feeling that little bit cold. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it was that, that I was I was in the vicinity of Joe Malloy when Tiger won, so I just, <laughs> I just fed off the energy. <laughs> but, uh, did, did you see it, Rory? Yeah, I was actually in the office at uh, the Daily Mail, and it was, it was nice. It took our minds off other things mm-hmm. for a couple of hours. It was just a nice yeah. story. But it's, uh, as I said, it's, it's a weird thing with him because obviously this incredible you know, competitor, this, you know, this God-given talent, and obviously like, he was emotionally and physically broken. But I think Kimmich does really well of, on I share his view, that he just seems like a very contrary kind of strange character there's a great line there where he's just talking about <laughs> all the as we talk about his stinginess but all his all the deals like you know 30 million from Buick mm. 26 and a half million America Express Rolex EA Sports deals golf you know Wheaties and then but then he did the payoff is you know you'd rarely see him signing autographs or engaging with kids you know it's that sort of mm. there's a very kind of there's a coldness there you know yeah because there's an interesting yeah. one here uh, Neil he, um, Paul has gone to see him watched him play a lot and win big yeah. a lot like he mentioned being a congressional for US Open Troon for the Open winged foot for PGA Soto Grandi for Ryder Cup was there to watch him play Waterville in 99, his 10 shot win at Pebble Beach, there for the Tiger Slam in Augusta in 2001. So he's watched him hell of a lot. Mm. And he, he says that the more we saw of him, the less there was to cheer, which I think is an interesting line. And I often find this that, uh, I don't know if you guys agree, but uh, well, there's, um, if you interview somebody and you like them, you're biased afterwards, I find. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That you can often watch a game yeah. or if it's an individual sport, you always want them to do well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's completely irrational, like, because you don't even know of the interviews whether somebody is really like. Anybody can put on an act for 20 minutes or yeah, an hour you or whatever. Take, you just take to someone on a personal level. Yeah, because I think people have read before, first impressions, people make a first impression after seven seconds after meeting somebody to decide what they think of them. But... Uh, because uh, I remember just in, in a rugby mix on there's one there's one ru- player who was very fond of spitting lumps of chewed apple in your direction oh, yeah, when he's yes, talking. Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't shed any tears when he retired, <laughs> yeah. and he was a very good player. But you do perceptions count. So the, what what yeah. Paul has seen of Tiger and even stuff like not signing autographs for kids and stuff, it does make you it does colour your impression of somebody. And I think it does taint his legacy a bit. I think you have to be a bit more human and you have to be a bit more given to yourself and realise how lucky you are. Mm-hmm. You know? And and it does seem in the last couple of years he's, he, he's clearly working on that image a little bit. Mm. But it seems that no matter what he does, people will always still have it in his head that he's trying to work on you know, he, he's trying to change who he actually is. Yeah, he, deep in between down, he, playing with yeah, Donald deep Trump. Down, deep down, <laughs> he is that kind of, he's just a cold, pretty cold person. Deep down, he's very shallow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cynic in me would say, is there, I don't know, I'm I, I, I just spitballing, but like, is there a, does he have a team behind him or, and, they're, and they're pushing that? Does he have, is he in a room with a bunch of guys going, we need you to do this and yeah. we, need you to, we need to be more human, Tiger, you know, I yeah. just wonder. Um, like, Oliver Holt's piece then, yeah. it's probably less about Tiger Woods himself, it's probably more just about the the impact Tiger Woods has on golf. Yeah. That's, you know, it's, I thought it was a really interesting colour piece on uh, being there at Augusta when he wins and that uh, the headline, Tiger found his refuge from reality and it's probably just about how how much he captures the sport, really. Um, the opening paragraph is fantastic. Uh, mm. He's yeah. talking about the the drive he has from Alabama to Augusta, I think it was last year or something like that, uh, on his way to the Masters, and he's driving through these roads and you know stopping off at the the trucker stops and uh, the yellow of the Waffle House uh, sign was still lit up and the customers perched on stools at the counter, uh, cops with the lights on watching things go by. And then the last paragraph of it, uh, outside Hooters, John Daly's RV was in darkness. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the best yeah. written piece yeah. Yeah. in all the Sundays. Like, it's really evocative. It's yeah. really, uh, like, it's something you would have read from, you know, one of the new journalism masters of the 1970s or something. Like, it really reads mm. that way. Like, and I think he, he's, he's, 
he's deliberately adopted that kind of voice. Like it's a very American road trip voice, and uh, um, I like the piece a lot. Now it's more, it's kinder towards Woods. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's not a. It's it's very impressionistic. Yeah. Of, yeah. uh picture of what it was like to yeah. be there like it's not a it's not reportage really it's yeah. just uh it's it's, it's color I think, I think it a good it's more bigger than of, color yeah i think it paints a good description though of like despite all the flaws in him yeah the golf fans still absolutely adore him and he still is he still is golf yeah pretty much yeah yeah, that might be worrying for golf, that nobody yeah. else has emerged, you know, that's captured the imagination that mm -hmm. way. Maybe if Rory had won, would, would he have got that kind of glory? He might have got that kind of acclaim, given he was one of the few to do the Grand Slam. Yeah. And, and uh, he does seem a popular figure, and he's become a more interesting figure as he's got older, Rory. He has more to say for himself. And, um, but I don't know if he it, it would get the acclaim that Tiger got all right. Mm -hmm. so. uh, another interesting part on this, uh, um, when Woods was on the 18th tee, still out of sight around the fork in the fairway, a security guard pushed a small boy of eight or nine to the front, uh, front of the section of the crowd, and asked uh, the patrons if he could stand there so he could see. He heard the murmur of excitement as Woods stood on the right of the fairway, ready to play his approach on that historic final hole. But when Woods walked towards the green and the crowd stood to laud him, uh, whooping and roaring and applauding, it was too much. The boy darted away to find his parents. Maybe when he retells the experience in a few years to come, he'll emit his retreat from one of sport's defining moments. Uh, yeah, like it just, I suppose just the tension around the place, the the size of the crowds. I remember at the, I was at the Open last year at Carnoustie. Okay. And there was, you know, a spell for about an hour, 90 minutes on Sunday afternoon where Tiger was making a move and went to the top of the leaderboard briefly and everyone was going, oh my God, it's, it's happening. Yeah. And I could, you could absolutely just feel, feel the energy in the place lift. Yeah. Like Rory McIlroy made a move, went to the top of the leaderboard. There was a bit of a, wow, McIlroy's after making a big birdie putt here or a big eagle putt. Yeah. But it was just nothing on the scale of, of Tiger. Yeah, yeah. And even when he was coming up towards 18, I remember just the, the rush of people trying to get over there just to see him. He was out of contention at this stage. Molinari was going to tap in and win the tournament, but people just had to be there to see Tiger finishing off, you know? Yeah, yeah. It just shows the, I suppose, the, the grip he has on the sport. Yeah, the power of his aura. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we are running out of time here, probably just a few more minutes left. There was a piece on Liverpool in the Sunday yes. Times. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, find yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I find that very interesting yeah. because uh, it's Jonathan Northcroft, but he mentions it. It's a guy I actually follow on Twitter. He's a, he's a, he's a very... Uh, He's, he's a cool. rabid Liverpool fan. He's a bit one-eyed about Liverpool. Uh, Simon Brundish, but he's a he's a very well-regarded sports scientist, and it just gives an, an inkling into how, why Liverpool are where they are, and it's and a large part of it is um, uh, there's a line he uses a lot. Uh, Brundish availability, the most <coughs> underrated of all the of all the abilities. And seven key men this season for Liverpool, Salah, Alisson, Van Dijk, Firmino, Mane, Robertson and Van Aldem have only missed seven league games between them, which is extraordinary. And it's actually t it's built into the recruitment. Like, Alisson has never had a significant injury. He's missed only one match since coming to Europe three years ago. Salah's only missed a couple of matches in his career. His longest ever injury break was four weeks. Robertson is at one injury layoff ever. Wijnaldum has basically been injury free for five years Firmino and Mane hardly ever get injured Van Dijk had uh, an ankle one issue he was out for uh, he's, he's only experienced one issue ruling him out for longer than four days having his appendix out in 2011-2012 Fabino has missed one game through injury in his entire career when you look at City like De Bruyne is injured again mm -hmm. like uh, and it's one of the things I've often thought about is um I remember a couple of years ago, the Phillips Manager of the Year Award, it was shared between Pete Taylor and Billy Walsh because of the Olympic medals in London 2012. Mm. I remember a lot of the boxes were given out that uh, Zora, Zora Antia yeah. should have been uh, honoured as well. 
and because he was a brilliant technical coach. And like say, but uh, like Declan Kidney won that award, and Declan would have had kicking coach, scrum coach, uh, bass coach, forwards coach, etc. Mm. Like if Liverpool won the league, it'll all be Klopp's brilliant job. But it's not just about the manager. People forget that. Like he, he the size of a GA background. Team, yeah, right? like he obviously is a brilliant medical and physio team and mm. coaches, and they. <laughs> Uh, like even uh, Jonathan starts that off by mentioning you probably saw the pictures of Salah on a beach yeah. during the international break and that how Salah in the last couple of weeks like he looked he looked gone for the months before that yeah, and as but he's just been in well, a blistering form now that it's all when they need him most uh. yeah Klopp's belief in rest is such that he's taken Liverpool on eight mid-season training camps during his three and a half years in charge yeah so there's always this focus on you know, whether it's by design or by accident that they might have been out of a few cups and things yeah. like that, but it presents the it presents the opportunity to have these little breaks and just yeah. Just because because I remember looking at that before, and I think the game directly after each of those breaks, I think the, they've either drawn or lost. They haven't a great record at it, but March April the results have been really strong, and that seems to be when the effect of uh, a mid-season training break kicks in. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just shows you these things don't happen by accident, like players are recruited not just for their ability, it's often because they're injury free and also the importance of medical staff, but it's just a different slant on it, I thought it was something different. Yeah, yeah and there's a nice breakdown as well on the, just on the side there as well, Klopp's Liverpool uh, points in Premier League games from February towards the end of the season. 2016 it was 1.73, 2017 it was 2. 2018, 1.92, so more or less the mm. same. And 2019, now it's 2.4. Yeah, yeah. So you can see the benefits it's having mm. towards the end of a campaign. Yeah, you, you wonder as he, as he, as he, as he kind of tailored it because remember when he first came in, wasn't the whole the whole press was the fact that he was running them into the ground. Like, yeah, yeah. And it was because yeah, they needed last to play. Last year, the distances yeah. they were covering, yeah. they were yeah. constantly churning out those stats. Yeah, the, the, yeah. There the was, a, there was a big, uh, yeah, second. Uh, Second half of the season, they collapsed a bit. So he's clear. Well, they've changed the way they play. Like they're not. It's they're not, not the gong ho. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Like they're more yeah. They're more. Yeah. They're more controlled now. And also, I think he has changed. Co he, well, he's definitely changed coaching staff. I think he's changed medical staff as well. So that impacts. And because I remember, uh, um, was it Gu when Guardiola was at Bayern? He had very public rows with medical staff and the doctors mm. over players getting injured. So. Um, the, uh, the, there is something to it, I think. Um, what I found really interesting with Liverpool actually is, even just aside from physically how they're looking sharp, they're actually looking mentally a lot fitter over the last couple of well, months. Well, that, that, that staggers me because they looked like they looked riddled with nerves in January, February. I remember but the, the, Chris, the Crystal Palace really, game. Yeah, yeah, they look really confident now yeah. when the pressure should be on them to yeah. a greater extent. And I think it's feeding into the fans as well. Yeah, I remember, yeah. I'd like, it's Crystal Palace is the game that stands out for yeah, me. Yeah. Might be different games for other people, but remember the like the sheer nerves around Anfield yeah, there was before a few, the game. Yeah, Crystal during. Palace, Burnley and Leicester, yeah. those games were really nervy, Brighton away. There was a few of those that were at, really nervy. You look yeah. at Chelsea last week yeah, and yeah. Spurs the week before the games where they probably should have been nervous and they probably should have been edgy. The players looked sharp, they looked confident, they looked like they knew what they were going out to do and the fans didn't seem overly worried either. Yeah. And the longer it goes on, they just seem to, they're coping a lot better with it. Yeah. But it's amazing because I, I, I do think they'll fall short. I think they'll win three and draw one of the last four. I think there'll be a draw somewhere. But that would mean they'll end up with 95 points which up to this one season, defeat. yeah, yeah. Which up to this season will be second highest points tally ever, with yeah. one defeat, which yeah. has hardly ever been done. And but they still f uh, finished behind City, and people say they're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Well, you know, luck comes into it as well, just in terms of the like picking up, picking up. Never mind like the little hamstring injuries that yeah, you can yeah. manage and stuff. But it's the big injuries, like Leicester a few years ago as well. Yeah, they used. Very small number of players. Yeah, yeah. They, they got lucky that their key men were around at the key. Well, jobs. Liverpool, as that piece mentions, have effectively used fifteen players, yeah. which yeah. in this day and age is uh, is amazing. Uh, um, do you just want to finish? Quick word on GA. Do you yeah. want to mention? Do Almost you want to take it, Rory? Yeah. You want to throw out there a highlight? You yeah. the GA piece, uh, Rory. You want yeah, to mention? Yeah, just it just uh, very quickly. Um, you know, Boyas, obviously, his colleague and a, and a mate, but uh, Shane's just done a nice kind of piece on David Clifford. He's this new kind of. New starlet down in Kerry, and um, you know they're they're he's kind of it's very good. He's kind of spoken to Derek Kinage and a few guys who kind of coached him and stuff. But it's just Shane's really really good at that kind of stuff. And um, That's Shane McGrath, isn't it? yeah, Shane McGrath, yeah. yeah. Um, but just just uh, just sorry, just, just kind of go off the off point a bit. You know, just just even today, you know, like thirty pages in the Mail on Sunday, and obviously there's been talk about you know cutbacks in our place, like you know 
between designers and subs and you know the sports editor. I mean, there was four people put this mm. paper together yesterday in the office. Yeah, and pages you know, of yeah, thirty pages of sport. You know, and obviously we you know we work with London and stuff, but I guess it just shows the the climate we're in, and it just shows you know like the you know the, the work and the, the the toil that people are putting in to get. I think you know the paper looks good today. You know, it's just just want to give a shout out to the guys who you know. Put in, put in the, put in the work yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. What like, I find yeah, amazing yeah. is that nine pages of GA, which is <laughs> the deserve yeah, credit for that because yeah, yeah, yeah. I know from in April. I know from experience, April is a nightmare for like. There's a lot of filler around GA wise this month because, yeah. like the club stuff is more local media thing. I think it's not as it's not as much uh, a national newspaper or a national media outlet Until stuff. Until you get down to the business end yeah, of the competition. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Uh, you just see a lot of waffly features around this month. Like it's really, uh, I think it's a, it's a problem for it's, it is a structural problem in in even trying to market the games or sell. And it's a problem for because a huge amount of people are mad GA fans that don't want to read about anything else. And mm -hmm. it's a month where it's very hard to find anything that's interesting. So I think uh, the mail getting nine pages out of this Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> they're under corn this weekend. The lads like yeah. Uh, what's the solution? Do you think current or is there is it just more gigs or is there something or, or I, I, well a league yeah. based. Championship, yep. you know, the, you need to change the calendar some way. Like the, the uh, by all accounts, April isn't working. You know, it's just uh, there's a lot of disquiet over the April club month. So I think I don't know. It, it's a big, it's a big question, not an easy answer to. It, no. mm -hmm. Okay, guys, uh, we're out of time. Rory and Kieran, <laughs> thanks for coming in. No thanks, Rory, no enjoy the enjoy the Aviva later on oh, today. Yeah. Kieran, enjoy a bit of family time. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, we'll be back on the air at one o'clock on News Talk, actually, where we'll have Andy Dunn will be at the Aviva Stadium for us keeping us up to date on Leinster against Toulouse in the Heineken Champions Cup. We'll have two Premier League games, half past one, Stephen Doyle and Alan Stubbs will be at Goodison Park for Everton against Manchester United. And after that, we'll be over to the Cardiff City Stadium, Cardiff against Liverpool at four. That's with Ian Beach and Alan McLaughlin. You can join us then.